Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for Locked Clips, Ropes Course Trends in Technology. My name is Ben Haas, and uh, I'll be your host and presenter today. It's going to pop back over to our slides here. We'll get rolling. If you do have any questions, feel free to uh, ask them in the, the chat. And then when I have a little pause, we'll uh, go ahead and, and answer those for you. So our agenda for today. Uh, is going to be doing a, a short introduction here in a second, uh, going over the trends for ropes course technology over what's developed over the years, uh, talking a little bit about the balance between risk management um, and the experience our climbers will have, and of course, uh, a Q&A at the end for any questions you all might have. As I mentioned, my name is Ben Haas. I'm the Managing Director with Ropes Park Equipment. Uh, I've been in my role here with Ropes Park and with Ropes Park as a whole for a bit over six years now. I personally got my start in the challenge course industry uh, in the Boy Scouts. Uh, I worked with them for many years running their uh, COPE program, their Challenging Outdoor Personal Experience, uh, at the local scout camp that I attended. Uh, and I believe overall I've been doing this uh, or in this been involved in this industry for about 13 years. Um, and for everyone at the end, I will have a, uh, a copy of my contact details. A little bit about Ropes Park. Um, Ropes Park started in about 2008. Our goal is to be that one-stop shop uh, for everyone uh, in the adventure industry, whether you're a traditional challenge course, um, the operator of a big zip line, a pay-to-play canopy adventure, or an aerial adventure park. Uh, our goal is to kind of be your, uh, your main shopping cart, your Amazon for all those special needs that our industry would use. So right into our topic here of trends in the ropes course industry. Uh, one of the most important pieces of equipment anyone's going to use, whether you're a traditional ropes course, zip line tour, um, aerial adventure park, is going to be that belay. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a geek. I love the little fun facts. So I uh, research a little bit about what belay means, where that word comes from. Uh, and it's been around since about the uh, 1550. Uh, so it has quite a history and it started out as a nautical term meaning to stop or secure the end of the rope uh, and that's definitely evolved over the years into how we define it now where we're stopping or securing uh, the end of a rope that has a climber on the far side so i wanted to go over the types of belays out there uh, and how they're used and uh, their pros and cons so starting we're going to talk about the static belay uh, it's probably one of the most uh, like older styles of belay uh, and common in a lot of traditional courses. Uh, to define it, it's a fixed length tether that limits the fall a participant may have. It's most commonly a dual lanyard tether. Uh, we have a photo here of an example of one. You might also hear them called lobster claws, uh, is a, a term a lot of folks have used over the years. The way they work on a course uh, the one end is attached to that participant or climber, and then the two legs are moved from one safety line to another. Um, transfers might be done with the assistance of a staff, or commonly a, the participant may be moving them by them, themselves. A um, few pros with them, they are a cheaper piece of a hardware to purchase. Uh, they do limit a climber's fall. Uh, they allow movement around other people, around obstacles, poles, or other things someone might incur in a, or find in the course. Some of the cons though is they need to be used 100% correct, correctly uh, and all the onus of how they're used is put on that user um, to make sure that they're attaching them to the appropriate lifeline and that they're opening or closing them at the appropriate time. They can make assist or rescues on a course a bit harder because uh, they, they do have that set uh, length to them um, which does not allow you to lower someone to the ground. So if someone is uh, maybe fainted uh, and needs to be assisted off the course, uh, you now have to think a little differently or use some different tools to be able to get them back to, to earth. The dynamic belay is another very commonly used style of belaying on a course. Uh, to define that, it's uh, 
an appropriately appropriate rope going from a participant up to an anchor, uh, commonly above that participant, and then back down to the ground to either a belayer or a group of belayers that control the slack or the tension in the line. As someone climbs, that slack is taken out, and as they want to come down, the slack is loosened, um, which may also happen as someone's moving horizontally across an element um, to work with uh, the shape of that element. Transfers can be a little more complicated with this. So as we see in our photo here, if someone had to go around a pole, uh, their uh, dynamic belay isn't going to follow with them. They're going to have to transfer from one line to another, uh, which can involve a lot more commands, uh, a lot more visual assisting to make sure that that belay is done properly. A few pros with that, um, you have great control of the slack or, or the tension in that belay for the climber. So if you have uh, some youth that may need some a little more assistance, you're able to tighten up on that. Um, and as well as if someone does want to come off that course, they're just ready to come down. That uh, gives you a lot of control to lower them down or even uh, help them up a little bit if they need that assistance. It does give the opportunity to involve a lot more participants. So you can use a, a group or team belay uh, on the ground and have more than just one or two people involved in that activity. A few cons, as I mentioned before, the transfers can be fairly complicated if you have to go around uh, an obstacle and switching from one safety line to another. Uh, and they do require some more training and some proficiency in the skill of belay. Next, we have our continuous belays. Uh, continuous belay is a fixed length tether uh, used to limit someone's fall. Uh, commonly, it's going to be a single lanyard uh, and often has either a hook or a trolley, as we see in the photo here, that will slide along a cable or a track. Um, they're a little similar to static belays, uh, but there isn't a need for a transfer. That hook or trolley will slide along the same cable and work its way around any junction or attachment points. Uh, they're not as commonly seen in recreational camp or co collegiate programs. Uh, you see them more on some of the, the pay-to-play courses, uh, maybe in a mall or a, a pop-up uh, adventure course. The pros with them is once you're connected on there, the participants cannot disconnect from the system. Uh, it's very easy for them to use, very easy for uh, young participants, kids to use by just dragging that hook or trolley along with them. A few cons though, they can be more expensive, a little more difficult to install, the hardware involved might be a little more difficult, uh, and they limit the customer's involvement or their, their engagement with the, uh, the belay system. And there can also be uh, some difficulty in passing one another. Uh, depending on the continuous belay system, they might not have the ability to pass someone uh, if they're trying to go ahead of their friend or around someone who might be a little bit slower. Uh, they also can have some difficulties with changes in heights. Uh, if you have a multi-level course, going from one level to the other can be difficult with a continuous belay. And that's going to bring us to our fourth style belay called a smart belay. Um, smart belay is again going to be a little similar to the static belays. It's going to be a fixed length tether that limits someone's fall. Uh, commonly a dual lanyard, as we spoke about before with the static belay. But the carabiners on a static, or sorry, on a smart belay system are going to be smart in some, some fashion, where they can be locked and unlocked only at designated points around the course uh, and giving, uh, giving the control, feel of control to the participants. Smart belays of the style were initially pioneered by Philip Strasse out of Austria. Uh, and there's a few different uh, competitors out there. Uh, there used to be the Fornec SSB, uh, there's the Ederid Smart Belay, uh, and Click It. And most recent, uh, I want to say an addition to the market, but it's really uh, an evolution to the market, uh, is Locked Clips, which replaced the Fornec SSB uh, this year. The way that they work is there's like, some sort of key on the, sys on the uh, course uh, that allows both the operator to designate where you want someone to clip to and allows the participant to find their way along your course. Uh, they're seen throughout the adventure world, whether it's at a camp, a, play to, a pay to play location, um, university, uh, or other. 
A few pros with them is they can be very simple to use and very intuitive. Uh, younger kids are uh, very quick at picking up how to work with them. Uh, they allow climbers to only connect in designated areas, which is a, a big pro over some of the, the older styles that you need to um, really highlight with your participants where they're clipping into. Uh, they're low weight, uh, low maintenance, um, and easy to pass around someone. So you can skip over someone on a course with, uh, without having to be, say, stuck behind a, a slower climber. And it can help reduce some of the training and the staff overhead. Uh, when you have a belay system that maintains the a higher level of safety for you, uh, can help reduce the overhead and, of people having to watch out for those participants uh, and in making sure they're, they're clipping correctly when the system inherently makes them clip, clip correctly. A few cons, they are more costly or can be more costly to purchase upfront. Um, and they can, like the static belay, uh, make assists or rescues a little bit more difficult um, because there's a fixed length of tether that if you need to lower them down, you're going to first have to raise them and take them off that safety system and add them to another one to bring them down. Uh, here's a little photo of locked clips um, that came out again this year. Uh, it's a redesign of the older SSB where a lot of the features that worked wonderfully were improved uh, and those uh, that weren't so were, were taken away. Um, it's about a pound lighter than the old SSB is um, and it's been working great this year uh, all throughout the, the, the world. The way the locked clips work um, is they use a tweezel. You can see that here in the center. Let me get my little laser pen out. So we have our, our tweezel here. Um, those are put out around the course at designated locations where you want someone to lock their lanyard into. Um, the great thing about the Smart Belay like lock clips is that they only ever lock in to a safety line. Um, they cannot be unlocked by the, by the user. So the participant takes their unlocked carabiner, places it on the safety line, lets the gate close, brings it over to the tweezel and pushes up to lock that gate. Then as they progress through their course, when they, whether they choose uh, which level to go on, which element to go across, they find their next tweezel and repeat the process. So here we have a, a tweezel on like a waiting platform and then the next one to go across. Uh, and you can have these be in different directions, different color codes, um, and different levels of your course. Now, at the beginning, I mentioned there's a balance between risk management and customer experience, depending on what kind of belay you pick. Um, we always want to be trying to do our best to reduce risk throughout any of our adventures, or at least the perception of risk. Uh, it may seem a little scary to customers being up high, but our job is to reduce any risk as much as we can for them. And we also want them to be engaged in it. We don't want them to feel like they're just sitting uh, in a car long for the ride, but we want them to be experiencing what it's like to be out in the trees, up on a tower, or riding down that zip line. So I've made a little chart here on our vertical axis. We're gonna have low risk at the, the top and, and higher risk um, at the bottom. And then across our horizontal axis, we'll have uh, lower climber en engagement. So they're not uh, interacting with the system as much on the left. Uh, and higher climber engagement on the right. Static belay, one of the first ones we, we spoke about. Um, I would put that one down there between uh, on the higher risk and uh, higher climber engagement side. Um, as we mentioned, the participant is able to move their clips around so they get a feel for the, the safety system um, and are participating in uh, their their trip along of our, our course. Um, however, with that, it brings a higher risk that they need to always clip to the appropriate line. We need them clipping to our safety lines, not to any of the other ropes or element lines that might be out there. On the opposite side from that would be our continuous belay systems. Um, so those would be very low risk and also lower customer engagement. Um, those are those pre-shaped hooks or trolleys 
uh, that once placed on to that safety line are just dragged or slid around with them. Um, again, once that is connected to the line, there is not a way for the participant to take that off. So the risk has been uh, reduced greatly, but there is no real engagement of the customer um, other than walking along the, the course. Their safety tether is just hanging above or alongside of them and being drug along with them. Now, straddling one of these axes is gonna be dynamic belay. Um, the reason I've done that is because dynamic belays can be facilitated in a few different ways. Um, it's definitely gonna have a higher climber engagement. Um, they're tying that into their harness. They're helping move it from a uh, section of the course to the next section of the course if they're going around, say, a pole or a tree. Um, and the risk should be uh, reduced a, a good amount with proper training and use of it. Um, this might move up or down a little bit, depending on who's belaying. If you have a, a seasoned staff member uh, doing your, your belaying and, and they're belaying all of your participants, your risk level is going to go down a bit. Uh, if you have a team belay or you have the campers for that season that have gone through a, a small belaying course belaying that year, your risk level might be going up a little higher because they might not be as proficient um, as that longtime staff member. And then last in the upper right is our smart belays, which are gonna have a very low risk, but also a very high climber engagement. When properly used and connected to that course, the participant's able to move themselves around from go from element to the element and have the feeling of, the, of them being in control, but we've taken the risk of them clipping uh, outside of where we want them to clip by using that tweezel system so that they can only attach to the lifelines that we've put a tweezel on. So from our side, the, le the, re the risk has been reduced. And then from their side, the engagement has been increased because they get to move around and choose which direction they go, if they're going to let their friend pass them and, and have that feel of control over their safety lanyards. Uh, and with that, I'm going to bring us over to so many questions and answers that you guys may have. Um, and right before I start that, though, I will just put the last slide up that has my contact details. So if anyone needs to reach out after, you can feel free to. So I'll put this up for a second, and then I'll stop presenting here uh, so we can see everyone's uh, faces and see any questions out there. Well, thanks again, everyone, for attending today. Have a great rest of the week. If you have any questions about lock clips or any other bits of equipment, please feel to reach out.